I hope you brought your copy of God's Word with you today. If not, we got you covered. <laughs> today we're going to look at a couple of people in the narrative that we're probably very familiar with. And as we are reflecting on this couple, I want you to think how God uses ordinary people just like you and I. Just how God uses people in this world and his mission is sometimes mind-boggling. And I've often thought, why in the world does God use some of the people that he does? What are the qualifications? What are the qualifications in which a person would be used by God? Now, oftentimes we think that people in the Bible are extraordinary, and yet they have an extraordinary task. We often think about Abraham, we think about Moses, we think about David in the Bible, and we, we have this tendency to, to put them up here. We have a tendency to, to lift them up. And although there are some characteristics that we see in Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob and all the biblical characters and narrative of the Old Testament... And although they have some good characteristics, I want to submit to you that they are ordinary people. They were ordinary people that God used to do extraordinary things. And so my message this morning is, is just simply entitled, Ordinary People, Extraordinary God. We are the ordinary people. And He is an absolutely extraordinary God. We're going to look at some Old Testament uh, Scriptures in particular, or we're going to survey the Old Testament just very briefly. We're going to think about Abraham and how Abraham was, he was given a covenant. And he was going on Mount Sinai and going to sacrifice his son. And yet, the angel stopped the hand of Abraham. And we see something extraordinary about that. But we also see in Abraham some character flaws. Some doubts had accumulated in, in Abraham's life. He'd even lied. Moses. We think about Moses as this grand uh, figure in the Old Testament, and he was. But also Moses was a person at one time who murdered somebody. He was an ordinary person. We think about David, and so we lift King David up. Matter of fact, we read about David in the Bible, and we read about the lineage of, of the Messiah and Jesus. And David's lineage is absolutely the lineage in which the Messiah would be born into the world. And yet David, he was a murderer as well. Forgiven by God, yes, but ordinary. So my message this morning is ordinary people, extraordinary God. And I would invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18 through the end of the chapter. We're going to survey this text and bring out a few uh, key and a few important uh, points in the narrative at the end of chapter 1. Uh, would you pray with me? Father, thank you today that you have given us the, the chance and the opportunity to come into your house. And we just want to thank you, Father, that you are good to us. And we ask you, Father, that you would today speak to hearts and minds. Speak to those uh, who do not know you today. Give us the reassurance, Father, that we uh, can serve you as long as we are, are obedient to you. We just thank you and we praise you for everything you have done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so when I think about the biblical text here this morning, uh, speaking of jo Mary and Joseph, we have the tendency, again, to lift people up, it seems. We have this inclination to put people up on this high bar and pedestal. Now, we're going into a season where we're taking up a Lottie Moon offering. Some of our mentalities is that missionaries on the mission field are like super people, super Christian. And although they have an extraordinary and a supernatural task ahead of them of sharing the good news, they are ordinary people like you and I. We have a misconception that God cannot use us unless we're above and beyond the call in our Christian duty. There is a call that, uh, that God puts on one's life, but it is a call to ordinary people like you and I. Uh, he uses people. Uh, 
teachers in Sunday school classes. He used pastors. He uses people to go on the missions field. And they are ordinary people just like you and I. And all they have done is said, you know what, I'm going to be obedient to the Lord. And so is the case with Mary and Joseph. Specifically, Joseph this morning is one of those characters that we're going to zero in on. God using ordinary people. He uses every single one of us in some capacity. If we would just say, Lord, use me. If we would just say, Lord, use me, wherever you would have me at. Now, you might say, well, I know some people who are sitting at home. They are elderly. They can't get out. I'll tell you what. God uses them sometimes more than he does a, a, a number of us. And I'll tell you why. Because I can go to some people's house, and I have been, where they have, could not come to church because they were sick. You might say, well, how in the world did they minister to you? When I walked in the door, they had, every they had all the... Um, the ability, if you will, to be sad and depressed. But when they looked at me, they smiled and they had a joy in their life because they knew Jesus. And when I walked into the house, they were not only happy to see me, but they loved the Lord Jesus Christ as well. So don't tell me that people sitting at home can't be ministers right where they're at because they absolutely can. I've seen it time after time after time again. God using ordinary people to do extraordinary things. There's been times when I've been depressed and down, and I would see someone, I'd go to someone's house, and they would just smile and say, thank you for coming, and it would, all, it would, it would just lift me up that day. And so I'm thankful that God does use ordinary people. I'm thankful that God uses me, this old country boy, back in the Jacksonville, Onslow County, Jacksonville, North Carolina, and called me to preach. I still can't figure out why he's done that, but I'm so thankful that he has. I'm so thankful that I got to, choose, uh, I got to serve the Lord in some way in this world. And so I want us to be just kind of zero in on the life of Joseph and also Mary. And Lord will permit us next Sunday night, we're going to look at the gospel narrative in Luke a little bit further. But today we're just going to stand back and we're just going to look at Mary and Joseph's life, these two ordinary people in the world at the right place, at the right time that God orchestrated and brought together in a right and perfect time of history to bring his son into the world. So if you will, let's pray and then we'll jump into verse 18. Father, we ask you today that you would bless this word as we begin to read, Father, that you would just help us to understand it and help us, Father, as ordinary people to be coupled with your mission. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Many of your Bibles might say, now the birth of Jesus Christ, it happened this way. Or it happened on this fashion. But it happened on the wise or in this manner or in this fashion. Now what uh, Matthew is doing here after he has gone through verses 1 through 17, we ask ourselves, well, what is the purpose of the lineage here? He is showing us that the person of Jesus meets all the criteria for being the Messiah. He's setting up, this, this is all the criteria here, and Jesus meets them. He comes from the line uh, of David, and so he's laying that out for us. He says, now, as if to transition to another time, uh, to transition in another part of the narrative, he says, now, as if to say, Pay attention, here we go. Now, the birth of Jesus happened on this way, when as his mother Mary was a spouse, a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, as we stand back and look at this, one of the first things that might pop out, we, we know the story in Luke, as Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Mary was overshadowed by God himself, and thus uh, Mary was with child from that point forward. But one thing we want to stand back when we're looking at this is that it says Mary and Joseph were espoused. Something that I, don't, I think that uh, the culture today doesn't hold very sacred is the act of marriage. Many of us might. But the world as a whole, has they have belittled marriage. They have taken away the sacred nature of marriage. The one thing that we can learn from these two ordinary people is that they thought something of marriage to the fact when they came together and they, they were engaged, that to break that engagement, you had to have a written statement of divorce. It was equivalent to our divorce today, but in the engagement stage. To get today, people get engaged, and it's just like this. Oh, we're done with that engagement. We're going to break that off. We just didn't meet all the criteria of one another. We just, we hated one another even. And so they would break this off. They wouldn't learn to love one another. They didn't hold marriage. They don't hold marriage on a, on, on a high level. I think this is something we can learn from these two ordinary people. 
that marriage was something sacred to them, meaning they didn't have, they didn't live together, they did not uh, fornicate one with another together. They held it very, very, a very sacred event. They knew that God orchestrated something in the marriage, and they held it very sacred. Now, before they came together, it says before they knew one another, before they were intimate with one another, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. And we can read about this in Luke as the, Gabriel, uh, the, the angel announced to Mary that she was going to be with child and the Spirit of the Lord overshadowed uh, Mary. I want you to notice something very specifically. We often think of Mary and we set Mary up on high. There are certain factions in, in Christianity, if you will, that would set Mary up on a pedestal. I will tell you today that Mary was an ordinary woman. She was, a, she was a poor Hebrew virgin girl that God used. And I'll tell you how we know that Mary was an ordinary woman. That she was blessed, yes, because the Messiah was going to come from her, uh, from her. But we notice in the scriptures as well that Mary, being an ordinary woman, understood her place before God. But why? Because she took a sacrifice. Both of them took a sacrifice. They brought a turtle dove. So that tells us something about their social status. They were not very rich. They weren't a very rich couple. They understood their social status. And they understood their need to be obedient to God and bring a sacrifice uh, to the temple. So those two things we know about them already by scripture. That they were ordinary people that God used. And I will tell you this morning you might be struggling with the fact. Hey I need to be doing something for the Lord and I don't know what it is. Or maybe you do this morning I would say to you that God can use you one of the best piece of advice I've ever heard was from a pastor back home and I said you know I preach I don't feel adequate and he said well the day that you feel adequate you need to close your Bible and you need to and you need to get out the ministry the day that you feel adequate to stand behind the pulpit and preach God's word will be the day that you need to quit and from that was a best piece of advice I think I've had in many years God uses you and I and we are inadequate in and of ourselves but when we are obedient to God he empowers us to do his mission and his will then Joseph her husband Mary's husband being a just man, how do we know he's a just man? We're going to show you at the end of this how he's considered to be a just man who obeys God. He obeys the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean that he is divine or he is, he is uh, the pious of all men. But amongst those men around him, amongst those contemporaries that were around him, Joseph was considered a just man, a righteous man. He tried to please the Lord. He tried to be obedient to God. And we're going to see this uh, practically in God's word as, as well. We're going to see what, uh, why Joseph is considered to be a just man. And he says this, he is not willing to make a public example and he was minded to put her away uh, privately. And so as, as we see some of the characteristics of Joseph, he could be a very uh, gentle man. He could be a very graceful man in the fact that he did not want to embarrass Mary. Not only embarrass Mary, but put Mary in danger. The penalty for sin and fornication would be that Mary would have been brought before a council and that she would have been stoned to death. Now, see, there is hardly any record that they actually, in, they actually kept this law. There wasn't very frequent records that showed where people were being stoned because of this. But see, Joseph didn't want to take the chance. He didn't want to put Mary before the court and then be found guilty and then her be stoned to death, which means he loved her. He loved her. He loved his wife and he wanted to show grace to her. He wanted to show mercy. Now we could put ourselves in that position. Men of the church we could put ourselves in this position. What if we were engaged? And then our wife comes and tells us, uh, tells you that, hey, I'm with child. And you know you haven't had relations. The first thing you're going to think is obvious. What are the, the first thing you're going to think is being the obvious thing? You're going to think that she had, uh, she had relations you're going to think that she cheated on you. You're going to think all kinds of things. And I can imagine these things went through Joseph's mind. And rightly so. But see, God took drastic measures. God is going to take drastic measures. We read about this through all the Old Testament. God took drastic measures to bring about his promises, to bring about his covenant. And that's exactly what we're going to see here in the miraculous when God invades the dream of Joseph. When God invades the dream, he says this. But while he thought on these things, and I would imagine he had a lot of thoughts at this point. Thoke thinks that Mary was a harlot. 
Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. We find this in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35 as well. One of the first things I want you to notice is that he is invaded, his mind, his dream is invaded by the angel of the Lord, and he calls to him, Joseph, thou son of David. He reminds him that he is in the line of David and thus reminds him of a promise given long, long ago. This is God acting in drastic ways. God has acted in drastic ways in the past when he parted the Red Sea. When the Hebrew people walked across on dry land, so much so that as they walked, the very dust began to float up as they walked across the Red Sea. Uh, drastic ma measures as God fed those in the wilderness. He fed them manna from heaven, a miracle coming from heaven as he fed and provided for his people. God acting in drastic measures to bring about his purpose and his covenant that one day, one day, he's going to invade Joseph's dreams and tell him exactly, hey, you are of the line of David. David, reminding him of this covenant, reminding him of the promise that there would be one that would sit on the throne and his lineage would never pass away and this one would be Jesus Christ. So he reminds him, he says, you are a son of David. Now a person might stand back in a skeptical mindset and say, well, you know, Joseph, uh, at this point, he really isn't, if we, if we go with the scripture, he really isn't the, the father of Jesus. And so one might say that he, he really isn't Jesus's daddy. But if you look at Mary's lineage, she's in the line of David as well. So as if God has it covered from whatever angle you go. God has this thing covered. He has brought this together perfectly. Perfectly in history. His perfect timing and his perfect will. But I will tell you what. When Jesus, would be, when Jesus is born, Joseph is going to love him like a son. Joseph is going to love on him just like he is his own flesh and blood. Knowing that he is born from God. Knowing that this is the Christ child. He reminds him, you are in the line of David. Fear not to take Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. You know, many times we need reminding of things. For the very reason that we're sitting here today hearing preaching, the reason that you go to your Sunday school classes and hear people uh, expound on the word, the very reason that you have small groups and discipleship, ability partners and prayer partners, the very reason that we do those things is that sometimes we can be reminded, hey, hey, God loves you. Sometimes we need to be reminded of the promises of God. Sometimes we take things for granted in our lives, and sometimes we need to be reminded of the goodness of God. And we need to be reminded sometimes of just the essential truths of salvation. And so the, the angel here reminds Joseph, you're in the line of David. There is a promise. There is a promise here. Take it again that these are ordinary people that God is using in a very extraordinary way. Unlike any person in all of human history, these two people are going to be used mightily of God. He goes on in verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now we're going to just focus a little bit on this name of Jesus. You believe there's power in the name of Jesus? I believe there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you why. Because in the name of Jesus is entailed salvation. When we say the name of Jesus, it entails salvation. Jesus, in the, in the wording here, goes back to a familiar character in your Bibles, in the narrative of the Old Testament, a familiar character that you might know as Joshua. When we say the name Joshua, we know that this, this name means deliverance. This name means salvation. A Hebrew person today would have said Yeshua if they were talking about Jesus, which is a rendering of Joshua from the Old Testament, meaning that Jesus Christ is the deliverer. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He brings salvation. And the angel here not only says you will name him Jesus, but gives a definition of what this name means. It is God saves, for he shall save his people from their sins. The only one in history to really fully live up to his name. You know, my name... Uh, <laughs> Larry, sometimes people would, would call me Lawrence, just jokingly. I had some friends back home. You know, they always used to call me Lawrence. Now, my name is not Lawrence, but I let them get away with it because they were close friends. 
And they would call me Lawrence, and I said, you know what, what does that name mean? So I broke down one day, and I did some research trying to figure out what Lawrence really meant. You know, some, some names have some, some significance to it. And I found out that Lawrence connotates wisdom. It means someone with wisdom. Now, although I don't know that I would fully meet the criteria of being a person with full wisdom, maybe I have glimpses of it here or there. People named Grace would have glimpses of grace in their life, I'm sure, but they do not fully live up to that name. I am not always and infinitely wise at all times. Jesus Christ is the only one that lives up to his name infinitely and fully throughout all of human history. He is the only one who has ever lived up to his name that he saves his people from their sins. Amen. Verse 22, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled. All of this was done that it would be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying. Now he's about to go in, Matthew's about to go in a reading, if you will, a recollection of Isaiah chapter 7. We might be familiar with this as the Emmanuel child. He's going to go back. He understands as Isaiah is giving this prophecy this is pointing to another time in history. This is pointing to something way down the road where Isaiah saw way down the road pointing to a Christ, pointing to the Messiah. He understood this as being Jesus Christ. Read with me if you will. This is a reference that Matthew is using. Now see, he would have opened up his Bible in the Old and the New Testament times here when Jesus walked the, when, when the times of Jesus. We call them Jesus times. The biblical time in the context of Matthew. If Matthew was to open up his Bible, if he was to read from Isaiah, he would have read a Greek translation of the Old Testament. He would have read the Greek translation. And so this is taken exactly from that Greek translation as he's reading it back into his own gospel that bears his name. He reads it such as this and he recollects on the uh, prophet Isaiah, as he says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. If ever anybody needed a verse, a proof text, that showed that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was going to be God with us, God in the flesh, here it is. He is literally called Jesus Christ, God with us us God in flesh if everyone any anyone on earth ever needed a proof text to show that this is Jesus Christ and he is divine here it is he is God with us I want you to notice something about this particular verse even of itself it says this last phrase God with us you know what's wonderful sometimes when we can read the scripture and we can just see God's hand just literally just orchestrating it all along God for us has, has woven a tapestry into scriptures. And I want you to notice one of these tapestries this morning. It does my heart very, it blesses my heart to see this. It, it, it brings us to a place of worship. And it should. I want you to notice something about this particular gospel. If you have your finger, place it in on this particular verse in chapter 1, verse 23. This is what I call the bookends to the book of Matthew. There are bookends here. Chapter 1 is this verse. God with us, take your finger, hold the place, and if you know where the Great Commission verses are, turn to those. Matthew, verse, Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. I want you to notice something about this, these bookends that Matthew has placed before his readers. I think this is an awesome picture of the divine orchestrating of God's word and his preservation of the word. Notice something. He is God with us coming into the world, born into the world. He is God with us coming into the world, and he is God with us as he leaves this earth to be with his Father. Notice, if you will, verse 20. As he leaves his disciples, he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, what does that phrase say? I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Isn't that wonderful? God has orchestrated this thing. That he is not only God with us when he comes into the world and is born into the world. But he is also God with us even when he has gone to the Father and sent his comforter. He is God with us then. He is Emmanuel. God with us from beginning and from the end. He will never leave you. He will no, no, never forsake you. Amen. Verse 24. As the Emmanuel child is presented 
as he is told about it, as he's prophesied. Verse 24, this shows us that Joseph was indeed an ordinary man, but he was a just man and an upright man. Verse 24, then Joseph being raised from his sleep, he did, well, this is what he did. He did just as the angel of the Lord bid him to do. He was obedient. He considered this to be a word from the Lord, be it from an angel. He considered it to be a word from the Lord, and he acted out in obedience, and he did as the Lord had bidden him to do. An ordinary person, an ordinary man obeying the Lord, and God using him mightily. And he took unto him his wife. Now, you could imagine people talking about them. Imagine this. Uh, Mary and Joseph begin to get married, and as soon as they get married, they announce that they're with child. Now, you know just as good as I how people are. They'll start counting. One, two, wait a minute. Hold on a minute. These months aren't adding up here. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Something don't seem right. And so they begin to, they begin to uh, formulate some rumors. Uh, hey, they were real truthful to one another in their engagement process. And, and so even though there might be some embarrassment, Joseph and Mary knew and they kept on. Ordinary people traveling on, being obedient to the will of the Lord. Even though while people surrounding them had formulated rumors and talked bad about them to be sure about their back, behind their back, they kept on obeying the Lord. Verse 20, or verse 25, and they knew, and he knew her not until she had brought forth the firstborn child. He didn't even try to even touch her until Jesus was born. Whether we call this reverence, or whether we just, him wanting to be obedient and making sure he don't mess up along the way, whatever the case is, it shows that Joseph, he did not even try to come near her until the Christ child was born into the world, meaning he understood the promise given and he had reverence that the Lord was at work. He knew the Lord was at work. How many of us in here has been filled, uh, we've, we know that the Lord is calling us to something. How, do, how many of us in here know that the Lord is calling us uh, to be on the mission, uh, on the mission field for him? Or to, do, or to teach, or to, to do some other thing. We think that we are inadequate. And all the Lord calls us to do and wants us to do is to serve Him. We don't have to be this grand speaker. We don't have to be a person that knows how to articulate every single word. And make sure it's all polished and pretty. The Lord can use any and every one of us. And in fact, we are commanded. We are commanded to serve the Lord. We are commanded to do something for Him. Even though we might be ordinary people, God has given us an extraordinary task. And he says that in verse 25, and he called his son Jesus. The only name under heaven in which men may be saved. The only name in which people can be saved. There's power in the name of Jesus. That is the extraordinary act here. That is the extraordinary God moving in history. We're ordinary people and God used every one of us. God can use every single one of us. So my prayer would be today, even as we reflect on this time of year, as we reflect on, on the Christ child coming into the world, the Messiah being born, there's something that can be said about the, all the events surrounding the Messiah's life. All the events surrounding the birth of Jesus just come together and fit perfectly. I think the Lord knew what he was doing. Everything fit together nicely and perfectly. Matter of fact, when Jesus uh, came into this earth, when Jesus was crucified, and when Jesus uh, was resurrected, think about the roads that the Romans used. Think about those roads that the Romans used and how those evangelists would travel those roads that had already been paved to take the gospel all throughout the whole world. God knew what he was doing. God knew what he was doing. He knows what he is doing when he calls people. And I would guarantee he's calling you to do something this morning, if not calling you to the Lord Jesus. Would you pray with me?